redundant, so your chest wall gets by without it. The surgeon can relocate it, and that's a, an artery supplying a new blood supply spliced into the uh, coronary artery south of the, south of the obstruction so that the, the muscle below the obstruction now gets new arterial blood supply from an actual artery. All right, it's a good solution. That artery is more stable than veins because it's used to seeing the high oxygen. This is a triple bypass. <clears throat> so there were two other blocked arteries on this heart. And you only have one thoracic artery, so you can only use that artery once. In this case, there are two vein grafts. So vein was harvested from this patient's leg, and you see there are two vein grafts that are spliced in at the top end. You can see there to the aorta, so they get new blood supply. And at the other end, which you can't see in this case because they're on the other side of the heart, they're spliced into also two more blocked arteries. Right. Those veins are going to be more problematic than the artery. The artery has a 10-year failure rate, maybe as low as 10 or 15 percent. The veins, 50 percent or more, will fail by 10 years. So that's, that's the problem with this surgery. So where does the Ohio State study come in? And I'm going to quickly take you through the results. It measured the wall thickness in human saphenous veins that were going to be used for surgery. The surgeon removes more than he needs because you, you don't want to run short of pipe if you're a plumber. So there's leftover, there's leftover pipe every time a, a person undergoes bypass surgery. That's what was used in this study. They were incubated either at low oxygen, and that's described here as the freshly isolated. They don't change if they're incubated in low oxygen, or at high oxygen. And after two weeks incubated, where the only variable really is high oxygen, you get intimal hyperplasia, you get wall thickening. So this was done outside living people, in a laboratory model. And so the blue bar is where the intimal thickness should be if you're looking at the A panel. The red bar is after two weeks at high oxygen and the wall has already thickened several fold. And the green bar is the same kind of a culture except protandum has been added to the culture medium. And so even in high oxygen, the protandum treated veins have avoided intimal hyperplasia. They, the walls have not thickened. They're staying at the same thickness as in freshly isolated healthy vein. Here we're measuring the intima, panel A, the media, the next layer in panel B. And what you can see, is with protandum in the diagram on the right, the, the intima and the medial layers are still thin. There's a big opening in this pipe. It's conducting lots of blood. The bottom picture is what happens if the thickening occurs, the red bars. And you can see that the, the, the area, a cross-sectional area, is reduced maybe by 80% in that diagram. So very little blood is now able to get through. So, Protandum has blocked this process that's really the bane of cardiac surgeons because they can do their surgery just fine, but it's the consequences, e even years, begin sometimes weeks or months, but certainly by years. Um, I think I'm not going to dwell on this. I don't want to turn you into histologists, and these pictures may be ugly. But if you look at just A, B, and C, and you say one of these is not like the other, you might pick, you might pick the middle one. So even if you don't know what you're looking at, it certainly looks different. A is a healthy vein, freshly isolated. C is a vein incubated at high oxygen in the presence of protandum, which looks a lot like A. The one in the middle that looks bad, and it has, you can see there, a neo-intimal layer and it's very thick so there's a lot of vessel thickening happening there prevented in C by protandum. Um, if you look at the number of cells that are actively dividing, again freshly isolated healthy vein, very few dividing cells, incubated in oxygen high, where it's going to see it if it becomes an artery or a replacement for an artery a lot of dividing cells. That's required for that wall to thicken. It takes more cells. They're multiplying and uh, getting thicker and thicker. Protandum, the right bar, completely blocks that intimal thickening. 
If we measure free radical production in these veins, uh, A, B, and C are again fresh vein, B is cultured at high oxygen, and C is high oxygen with protanum. And what we're looking for is the red fluorescent stain. So you can see in the red one, in the A, A panel, very little evidence of free radical production. B, a lot of it, and C, incubated with protanum for the two-week period back to the A levels. So it's blocking free radical production by scavenging those radicals. They're quantified in the bars on the right, so in the, the, the color code is the same. Blue is healthy, red, high oxygen, green, high oxygen with protandum. So again, we see the protection. This is looking at lipid peroxidation marker. This one is very closely related to T-bars, which was in our original study. It's a specific component of T-bars for HNE. And again, look at the level of 4-HNE in the blue bar. That's healthy. High oxygen, but with protandum, it's even lower this time than the blue bar. It's better, off, it's better than new. It's better than uh, the freshly isolated vein. But without protandum at high oxygen, you can see a lot of this lipid peroxidation product, maybe five times more. And why, why is this? the vein protected with protanum. Again, it's the same old story you've heard about in other studies. Three important antioxidant enzymes have been sharply upregulated. Again, the blue bar is normal healthy vein, incubated at high oxygen. Uh, the cells haven't induced the enzyme to protect them, but if we add protanum, the green bar, all three of these enzymes are dramatically induced to provide the protection that you saw in the previous slides. This is another measure in this particular case. Catalase was focused on because there's a convenient specific inhibitor of catalase. Turned out that catalase is absolutely sufficient, uh, sorry, absolutely necessary, but not sufficient necessarily to provide the protection. But see, catalase is a key enzyme. That's one of the two we began this quest of protandum studying, and it turns out to be uh, certainly very important. So the conclusions are that the saphenous veins used in arterial bypass surgery suffer from oxidative stress, and that's no big surprise due to the higher concentration of oxygen in the arterial blood that they're now asked to carry. As a consequence of the oxidative stress, intimal hyperplasia or thickening of the wall occurs, and that can eventually lead to reblockage or restenosis. You may have heard that, uh, that term used. Restenosis simply means that what was blocked and opened up is now reblocked. And the important part for us, protandum prevented this wall thickening in saphenous veins cultured at high oxygen suggesting that NERF2 activation may extend the life of arterialized veins in vivo. And I want to show, um, kind of out of time, but I want to mention angioplasty very quickly. This is a blocked artery, <clears throat> and you see it longitudinally and in cross-section with a big yellow plaque that's occluding part of the uh, lumen. Here, um, a catheter has been threaded into the up through the aorta and into the to coronary arteries. And this is a very thin looking wire, but it has an inflatable balloon on the end. And outside the balloon is a little collapsed wire cylinder. This is like if you took a piece of chicken wire and made a cylinder, you could compress it down into a very thin rod. And if you inflate the balloon that's inside, you can expand that cylinder. So that's what the surgeon does. He locates this where the plaque is, inflates the balloon, and you can see that wire mesh cylinder now being ex inflated, expanded. And that holds the vessel open. Without that wire stent, that's what a stent is. Without the stent, the vessel would collapse when you deflated the balloon, or at least largely. And so, here, after you expand the wire, the wire mesh, you deflate the balloon, pull it out, and now you've got an artery in the picture on the right in cross-section that has a, a wire cage holding that plaque against the wall, 
making sure there's a big lumen. The unfortunate part is this is six months later. These are from pigs. And on the left, you see a lumen that is wide open. And those little black dots are actually the wires in cross-section of the stent that's been expanded. So you can see it holding that vessel open. If you come back and look at another pig with another stent, but after six months, look at the difference. You can see that light pink tissue labeled entomal hyperplasia. That's a proliferation of cells that in only six months has closed that lumen down probably 80%. And that's the iatrogenic problem. It was created by placing the stent. The stent did a great job initially, but this is a problem with, and this is a bare metal stent. One of the ways um, medical device companies have responded to this is many stents are now coated. They're called uh, drug eluding stents or coated stents. And they are, have time release chemicals that inhibit entomal hyperplasia on the metal frame itself. That lasts for a while and it improves things maybe for a year or two, but not for the really long haul. So, so endomal hyperplasia is a real problem. Finally, this is carotid end arterectomy. The other procedure, this is the big arteries in the neck. And this is an actual picture of what uh, a frequent location for the plaque develop is a fork in the road. So this carotid artery, artery has a branch in the side of your neck. And that's where plaque often develops. This is what it looks like if the surgeon opens, <clears throat> opens that artery. It looks like a big chunk of a cheeseburger caught in there. Um, and what, what they do <laughs> is they literally, <laughs> literally scrape. If you had a cheeseburger for lunch, I'm sorry, but <laughs> they literally scrape that out and sew the artery back together. And it, it works with, with highly su uh, high success rate. I said after 10 years, about 70% are still fine. But that's a traumatic event for the artery. It's been opened up, the lining scraped out. And so these, when they fail, it's usually due to entomal hyperplasia as well. And so finally, <clears throat> whoops, I th thought there was one more slide, but maybe not. Uh, the implication is that one and a half million people a year undergo this procedure. And that's a huge, a huge number of people who have processes going on that are almost surely going to lead to failures of uh, these carotid arteries, bypass surgeries, the angioplasty, the coronary artery, end arterectomy, a big market for something that can help prevent entomal hyperplasia. And I think you're connected with a product that might be really useful to do exactly that. So sorry for overtime. Thank you very much. Hold my hand, we'll make the weird side of things.